classical cases we do targeted analysis. So this is the occasion where we predefine the compounds that we are trying to look in the samples. So for example, if we do food contaminants analysis, the, for example, pesticide analysis, then before we start analyzing any samples, we decide which pesticides we are going to look at. But what the problem in case of targeted analysis is, is that the contaminants can change. For example, new pesticides may be applied or some additional contaminants may become important for our samples. So what we do in non-target analysis is that we try to look at all possible compounds or we try to detect as many compounds as possible. And as we register these compounds with our analytical techniques, after we can start identifying which compounds were actually present. Though with this we try to not overlook any compounds that might emerge during the time or may be present in slightly different samples. And what's interesting about non target analysis is that uh, um, it has been done for quite a while with the GCMS, but in LCMS it has become really important over the couple of last years. Um, and in LCMS what we do is that we first try to identify the compounds formula, some formula, or with the aid of um, high resolution mass spectrometry and with the exact mass that we obtain from there. And then we also use additional information about polarity from the LC measurements and in cases we do fragmentation also in the mass spec, we also obtain information about the connectivity of different functional groups. So we can obtain the structural information of the compound as well with the aid of non-target analysis. Non-targeted analysis is actually very widely applied by chromatographers. So it has been used for already a couple of years in different um, fields of metabolomics. And now it is also picking up base in environmental applications as well as uh, food contaminants monitoring. And what is also very interesting is that uh, a lot of people are applying non-targeted screening or similar methods without actually calling it this way. So for example, if people are doing uh, drug development, they are also interested in what are the metabolites of the drugs. And they also analyze the metabolites form during the metabolism of the, of the drug and try to identify the structure. This kind of analysis is normal, not called non-target analysis, but is actually very, very similar to non-target analysis. There are basically two main obstacles in non-target analysis. The first is the vast amount of data that are generated with non-targeted uh, methods. So depending on exactly which hyphenated techniques and which modes are used, the data are four, um, five, six dimensional. So trying to really get the structural information out of these large, large data is very challenging. And both researchers as well as vendors are putting in a lot of effort to try to overcome it. The second thing is that in, with targeted methods we are used to obtaining also quantitative information about the compounds that we identify from the samples. And so far this information has not been available for non-targeted analysis, um, at least not in the first stage. Because what we normally do is that we take the uh, exact mass, the fragmentation spectra, the retention time, and we rely on modeling to obtain the structure. Or we use databases to, to assess what structures are present in the sample. So we do not run the standard substances, at least not in the first hand, which means that we are unable to build calibration graphs for uh, non-target analysis which also means that we cannot assess the concentration in the classical way. And to make um, non-targeted analysis quantitative, it would be very nice if we could rely on the peak areas that we obtain with LC HRMS measurements. 
However, the problem is that the liquid chromatography and high resolution mass spectrometry are connected with the ionization source and compounds are ionizing very differently in this ionization source. So the differences can be up to 100 million times. And if you would now simply look at the peak areas from the LCMS, then we would be getting not very reliable results. So a main obstacle is how to take into account these different ionization efficiencies. So our main aim was to try to um, model the ionization efficiency of the compounds in the electrospray ioniza ionization source and to do it in a reliable way so that we would account for the analysis conditions. So what was the gradient that was used in the analysis, what were the eluents, what was the instrument. And then to use these uh, estimated ionization efficiencies all to also to predict the concentrations of the compounds in the samples. And we have been able to predict the ionization efficiencies and also to apply these to predict the concentrations of the compounds for green tea samples where we um, analyzed metabolites of the green tea as well as for um, screening of uh, contaminants in cereal samples, so food contaminant screening basically. And um, what we observed was a pretty good prediction accuracy. So the prediction error for the green tea samples was 1.7 times, which is pretty good to keeping in mind that the ionization efficiencies themselves vary over millions and millions of times. So there are basically two main challenges in modeling ionization efficiencies. The first challenge is that ionization process in electrospray is very complicated. There are a number of factors influencing it and it is not an equilibrium process. This means that uh, we need to have a pretty solid uh, previous knowledge. And we built our study on the previous knowledge of the fundamental studies but both by other groups as well as our group. So we had kind of a previous knowledge which factors to take into account both from the compound side as well as the LC condition side. The second important thing is that we, if we do the ionization efficiency predictions, we don't want to apply them only in one laboratory and start to build a different model in another laboratory. So we'd like it to be universal enough which means that every time we do the ionization efficiency predictions, we need to transfer them to the lab where the measurements actually have been done with the non-targeted methods. And this we have been able to achieve by using a small amount of transformation compounds. So these can be uh, compounds that have been run in the same, same sequence with the samples. So this could be quality control samples that contain a couple of, of compounds with known concentrations. Or they could be also some compounds identified from the same sample with the targeted methods. Because sometimes also targeted and non-targeted analysis are combined into one method. Um, so there are a lot of practical ap applications for estimating the concentration for non-targeted screening. First of all, the prioritization becomes more reliable, the risk assessment as well as comparison of different samples. So let me try to elaborate on the risk assessment side. So for example, when we come back now to the pesticide analysis in the food and the food contaminants. So when we now detect some contaminant from the food sample, then we are interested in finding out also what could be the effect of this contaminant. Is it dangerous for us? Should we do something about it? So to now actually evaluate this effect, we need to know what is the compound. This information we obtain from the non-targeted uh, analysis. We also need to know what is their biological effect, so how toxic these compounds in general are. 
Uh, this we can do within silico uh, predictions. And we also need to know the concentrations to be combined with the biological effect. And now we allow also this concentration prediction together with the, uh, to, in addition to this uh, previously done uh, identification of the structure and uh, toxicity estimation. Uh, so the ionization in the electrospray source is unfortunately influenced by the matrix components that coalute with the compounds that we are interested in. And this effect is called matrix effect and it often results in strong ionization suppression, especially in case of complicated matrices such as blood, urine, tissue samples. So what we were interested in was to figure out if the ionization efficiency predictions that we have been doing are valid also under these strong ionization suppression conditions. And what my PhD student Pia did was that she studied the ionization efficiencies for pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical alikes in a number of biological samples of blood, plasma, tissue of, uh, of uh, brain, liver, urine. And what she found was that in spite of very, very strong ionization suppression, sometimes reaching 99%, the ionization efficiency values measured in this complicated matrix extracts, extracts are nicely correlated actually with the ionization efficiencies in, that are, have been measured in the solvent. So this means that the ionization efficiency predictions can also be applied for complicated matrices. Mm -hmm.